Opening song is on page 107 in Britain, France. We three kings.
on this day revealed your only begotten Son to all the nations by the guidance of a star. Grant in your mercy that we who know you already by faith may be brought to behold the beauty of your sublime glory. We pray through our Lord Jesus, who lives with you in the unity of the Spirit, one God forever and ever. has no one 
reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit. Namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. It was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. But the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise of Christ Jesus through the Gospel. The Word of the Lord. Isaiah tried to 
bring them a message of hope. And he said to them, don't give up. The light will shine and the darkness will be scattered. And he tells them that the Messiah will come to save them. And when he makes his appearance, our hearts will throb and they will flow over in love and joy at his presence. And tributaries from all over the world will come to Bethlehem and they will bring the fortunes of the world in homage before the Messiah. So out of this prophecy of Isaiah, the Gospel writer today, Matthew, builds on it with the presentation to us of the Magi from the Orient. And these three wise men, these three kings, you recall, they're kneeling now in front of the manger, but they were over here, hidden away, making their way over to Jerusalem. And here they are in front of the baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary, bringing their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This story is important for a number of reasons. One of them is that the wise men went to King Herod. And he, it says in the Gospel, becomes very frightened in all of Jerusalem with him because they know with this appearance of the new king, the old order is going to be shaken and perhaps things will never again be the same. Herod describes himself as the king of the Jews. He was a puppet king set up by the Roman Empire in a Jewish background and placed as king, he was seen to be someone who would temper the rebellion of the Jewish people against their oppression by the Romans. So he identified as the king of the Jews and he didn't want any competition. He didn't want anyone claiming the throne. So immediately he began to tremble and wonder what was going to take place. So he devises a plan. He asks the wise men where they saw the star, where it was to shine. The religious leaders indicated it was Bethlehem from their searching through the scriptures. And then Herod sends them, pretending that he too will bring homage to the newborn king. But of course we know that he goes and sends his armies to murder every child born in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus. So we see this competition for power between Herod and the newborn king. But most importantly, these wise men come from the great distances to the ends of the earth. And they represent that the new king, Jesus, is not just for the Hebrew people, but for the whole world. And they come and they bring gifts of frankincense and myrrh and gold to Jesus to worship the new king. This is really all we basically know about this story of the Magi. But because it has captured our imagination throughout the centuries, a lot of stories have grown up around the epiphany, around this manifestation. So for example, we never really knew that there were three kings, but it was just supposed that there were because there were three gifts. We never knew their names, but stories were begun and they were named to be uh, Balthazar, Melchior, and Caspar. And then it was said in other stories that one king was very young, another king was middle-aged, and another king was a senior, to show that all the ages of humanity would come and adore the Lord. And of course that they were representatives of the world that was known at the time. One was from Asia, one was from Africa, another was from Europe, all bringing adoration to the king. Star of wonder, star of night, star of royal beauty bright, the royalty of the earth is coming now to the manger in Bethlehem. And it must have shocked these kings because they would be aware of the, the triumph of power. And here they were meeting a baby, a king, in the deepest poverty. They must have wondered if the star led them to the wrong place. But they gave their gifts. Gold, the stories we go on to say, represented a gift for a king. Incense, 
frankincense was used in forms of worship. And so it was a representation of the divinity of Jesus. And myrrh was used at the time of death and the time when a body would be prepared to be buried. So it was representative of the humanity of Jesus that he too would die on the cross like all human beings. So all of these stories began to emerge over time. One of the ones in our, our time is the gift of the Magi. But a story I like very much is called The Other Wise Man. And perhaps you've seen a, seen a video of it or read the story. It was written by Henry Van Dyke in 1895. And Henry Van Dyke was a Presbyterian minister who uh, taught in New Jersey at Princeton University. He wrote this story, The Other Magi, The Other Wise Man. And it's to show uh, something very special that we can all think about today on this Feast of the Epiphany. The storyline is that there were four kings who were going to bring their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and the fourth king was going to bring jewelry or precious gems, a sapphire, a ruby, and a number of pearls. And, you know, of course in those days they didn't have cell phones and they had a hard time communicating, so they planned on this rendezvous for a long time that they would meet up outside the deserts of Jerusalem. And then together they would form a caravan and make their way to bring their gifts to the newborn king. Unfortunately, the other wise man named Archibald was delayed. He was making his way and he met a man dying in the path right before him. So he got off his horse and just like the Good Samaritan, he brought this man to a place where he could receive treatment for his ill health and he was nursed back, and he, uh, Artaban, spent a lot of money and a lot of time with him. So by the time he caught up to the rendezvous point, the other wise men had already left. And uh, they thought, well, maybe something happened to him, he couldn't make it, and they didn't want to lose any more time. So they headed out. So Artaban thought, well, what am I going to do now? So he had to sell his horse, uh, he had to buy a camel, he had to make his way across the desert and hire a guide, get tents and food and everything that would be needed for this long, dangerous journey. And he sold one of his pearls to help finance this trip. When he finally got to Bethlehem, he realized that the other three kings had already departed. And Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus had gone to Egypt. So Artaban was staying in a motel in someone's home and inn, and uh, there was this great commotion because all these soldiers invaded Bethlehem, and it was said that they were going to kill all of the newborn children, and that's exactly what was happening. And these soldiers banged on the door, and this where he was staying, and the owner, the woman, was frightened because she had a little baby. So Artaban gave the sapphire to the soldiers as a way to buy them off and save the woman and her baby. And then after that, he made his way about trying to find the newborn king of the Jews. But he traveled for 33 years, and all during those times, he kept meeting people who needed his assistance. So he sold the pearls, and he was constantly helping them with the wealth of his own treasure. And then finally, he heard that Jesus was in Jerusalem, and he was going to be crucified. So Artaban made his way there, and he was hoping that with a ruby sapphire, he would be able to save Jesus. He'd be able to uh, ransom Jesus with his treasure. But as he was making his way, there was a young girl who had been sold in slavery. At the time, uh, children could be sold in slavery to pay off a debt. And uh, she was going to pay off this debt for her family. And she was crying and pleading, and Artaban gave the last of his precious stones. And he saved the young girl. And right at that time, there was a great earthquake, and darkness fell upon the earth. And there was trembling, and it felt 
what was going, what was happening. And it was at that moment that Jesus died on the cross. And the house where Artaban was standing next to, it began to fall apart and one of the tiles fell off the roof and hit him in the head and killed him. But as he was dying, people were running by and they, they just stopped momentarily to see this light around him. And they heard a conversation and Artaban was saying, when did I see you hungry and I fed you? When were you thirsty and I gave you something to drink? When were you in prison and I visited you? When were you sick and I helped you? And then Artaban himself was filled with light and he realized from the voice of Jesus that every time he had done it, something for one of the least ones, he had done it for him. And at that moment, he was able to die in peace. It's a beautiful story to tell us that we have to give our treasures to those in need, to those who are suffering, to share our life with them, because with them we meet Christ, the Savior, the newborn King. And the treasure of our lives is not a sapphire or ruby or pearls, it's not frankincense or gold or myrrh, it's the treasure of our hearts, the treasure of who we are. And in giving ourselves to others, we give to Christ. And in that way, we bring Him our adoration. We kneel before Him in worship. We reverence Him as we reverence others. So today, we look at this beautiful star in the brightness of the other stars of the night. And we see this newborn Savior. And we see these three kings bringing in adoration. And we too, like that Old Testament of Isaiah, are light for the world's darkness. We too bring the light of that star into our world today. We too are an epiphany, a manifestation of God's love for others. So on this beautiful feast of the epiphany, let us uh, linger before this beautiful scene and let us ask the Lord's mercy that we will let the light of our lives shine in the darkness of our world today and bring warmth and joy and love to a world so desperate for it all. Let us stand now and pray. I believe in one God.
National Migration Week, that they may be kept safe and healthy as they struggle to find a home. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For renewal of prayer in our lives, that we may make time for God each day of this year and be attentive to God's invitations and promptings in our hearts.
sisters and brothers, let us pray. It is your sacrifice and mine. May be acceptable to our Almighty Father. Amen. Look with favor, Lord, we pray, on these gifts of your church, in which are offered now, not gold or frankincense or myrrh, but he who by them is proclaimed, sacrificed, and received, Jesus Christ, he who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God. For today you have revealed the mystery of our salvation in Christ our Savior, as a light for the nations. And when he appeared in our mortal nature, you made us new by the glory of his immortal nature. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and the powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. <laughs>
proclaim the work of your love until he comes again. And we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of blessing. Father, look with favor on this oblation of your church in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. And grant that by the power of the spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son, in whose body and blood we have communion. By our partaking of this mystery, Almighty Father, give us life through your Spirit. Grant that we may be conformed to the image of Jesus. Confirm us in the bond of communion, together with Francis our Pope and Christopher our Bishop, with all other bishops, priests, deacons, our parish community, and your entire people. <laughs> Grant that all the faithful of the church, looking into the signs of our times by the light of faith, may constantly devote ourselves to the service of the gospel. Keep us attentive to the needs of all people, sharing their grief and their pain, their joy and their hope. May we faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along the ways of your kingdom. And Father, remember our sisters and brothers who have fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ. Remember all of the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face. In the resurrection, give them the fullness of life. Father, grant also to us when our earthly pilgrimage is done, that we too may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever. In communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the apostles, the martyrs, and all of the saints, where we shall praise you and exalt you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Jesus Christ, you 
said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but look on the faith of your church, and graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will. You will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of our newborn Savior be with all of you. Amen. Let's offer each other a sign of grace. Give us the light to light the way. 